and a hush descended over the crowd. <laughs> it is good to see everyone tonight. Glad we can be here together to continue our study in Proverbs. I was telling Liz, especially a couple of nights before we get to our summer series, we're going to be booking it pretty hard because we're going to get through Proverbs. So help me before we get done <laughs> with the su or before we get to the summer. So, um, but it's uh, definitely a, a good study, encouraging study. I'm looking forward to uh, the next few weeks as we begin to wrap it up. We have a couple of announcements that I want to throw out there before we get into it, though. Um, for ladies who haven't heard, Bunko has been moved. It's not going to be on Tuesday the 18th. It's going to be on Thursday the 20th. Um, just to, uh, I think that they want to uh, avoid any interference with the gospel meeting. Um, so, uh, not the 18th, but the 20th, that's Thursday, uh, will be Bunko. Also, Ladies Bible Class will be tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We'll be looking at 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 49. 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 49. Wait, am I saying the wrong thing again? I told you, John, last time it wasn't done. We're doing John. Okay, I'm a week ahead again, guys. I caught myself this time. Proud of me. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to be in John 4. If you want to look forward to next week, we can look at First uh, Samuel. But we're going to be in John 4, 19 through 24 this week. Next week we'll be in the First Samuel one. So I think I'm all right now. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Anything else that we need to mention? Um, of course, birthday and anniversary, uh, we already mentioned is at the end of the month, so I think that's all the announcements. Does anybody have any other announcements that we need to add uh, this evening? All right. Well, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we are going to get into a, uh, a very interesting topic, I think on several levels in Proverbs. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for your great love and care, all that you have done for us. Thank you for... Uh, the reminders each day of the love that you have shown through physical blessings, the, uh, the spiritual blessings that you have revealed to us in your word, and uh, just the, uh, the knowledge, especially the further we get in life, that uh, as we look back, we can see your hand at work in our lives. Father, we are mindful that there are so many in this world who don't know you, who don't know the, the privilege and the, the comfort of being yours. Father, we pray that that can change. Father, we pray that uh, as much as is within our power, we can uh, be a force for good in this community, that we can uh, be uh, examples and uh, offer uh, and any uh, opportunity that we have uh, the, uh, the gospel message to those who either have not heard it or have not uh, heard it properly, Father. We pray that you would uh, please be with those who are sick, who are suffering at this time, who are going through various difficulties and uh, we pray that you would just bless them and uh, help them comfort them father we're mindful of those who uh, are going through uh, maybe not uh, physical uh, difficulties but uh, spiritual struggles father and we just pray that you would uh, be with them and comfort them as well uh, lord we uh, we pray for our country and for our leaders we know that many times we look at our world and the direction that our world is going and can be easy to despair but father help us to remember that you are in control and that uh, quite frankly mankind has always been like this and we just pray that you would give us the strength and the wisdom and the endurance to uh, put you first and keep our focus on you uh, father we would uh, ask that you help us as we're striving to gain more from your wisdom this evening as we're looking at the book of proverbs father we're so thankful for this book and we ask that the things that we learn tonight will help us as we are striving to grow closer to you we pray all this in the name of your Son. Amen. All right. If I'm not careful, I'm going to start reading you Proverbs from next week, too. Okay. We are looking at integrity and excess. Integrity and excess as we are uh, going through Proverbs tonight. Integrity, as we're looking at this, being the idea not necessarily of... Honesty, we're going to look at that much more specifically in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the idea of being trustworthy in a more sense of reliability. So not, I know that you're telling me the truth, but I know you're going to follow through with what you've said. Or uh, I know the kind of person you are. I can, uh, I can vouch for your character, that kind of idea. In excess, kind of, in a sense, the opposite of that being 
uh, a person who does not have integrity or self-control and therefore uh, allows themselves to pursue things that even might not be inherently wrong, but uh, when pursued to the level that they often are, uh, become wrong. Let's start in 14 and verse 2 as we begin. Proverbs 14 and verse 2. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. Another word might be perverse, or really I think the root word is crooked in his ways. So as we are looking at this, and you say whoever walks in uprightness, we mentioned a little bit about this idea of what we're talking about when we say integrity, right? So how does uprightness and integrity go together if we're thinking about it as, as we just mentioned? There's a connection between uprightness and integrity. Most people with integrity want to do things that are right. Okay, good. How do we know what is right? God's word. Okay. The idea of uprightness, you're exactly right. The idea of uprightness or righteousness is the idea of following a specific standard. Now, in Scripture, of course, if we're talking about righteousness, we're talking about God's standard specifically. Integrity and uprightness and righteousness, all those things imply this idea of a standard. And in a sense, in a limited sense, of course, even as we see throughout Proverbs, you can be, again, in a very limited sense, a person of integrity without following God in the sense of we know people who are trustworthy, at least in certain areas of life. We know people who are following some kind of standard, have some kind of code that they are going to follow and that's reliable. But the difference is Solomon's talking about not only someone who has a code and follows it, but has the right code. The one who walks in uprightness. That's the code, the righteousness of God, the, the uprightness of man trying to follow God's standard. That is the one who fears the Lord. But... He who is crooked in his ways, in other words, as we've used so many times, right, plowing a field and getting the rows crooked and all of a sudden you can't get them straight again. He who is crooked or devious or perverse in his ways despises him. In other words, if you're not using God's standard, you are opposed to God's standard. The whole thing that Jesus says, right, those who are not with me are against me. Let's look at 14 and verse 14, a few verses down in the same chapter. The backslider in heart will be full of his own, or with a, filled with the fruit, rather, of his own ways. And a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. Does this remind you of anything? There's a slight difference in translation, by the way. So your translation might say something slightly different. But the idea is ultimately still the same when you uh, boil it down. So a righteous person, someone who's doing good, right? They're going to get the fruit of their way. A wicked person is going to get the fruit of their way. Does that remind you of anything? Reap what you sow. Okay, good. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap, right? Uh, Galatians 6, 7 says something to that effect, right? So uh, we have, even back in uh, the Old Testament, I would argue maybe even especially back in the Old Testament, because this was a concept that was easier to grasp without the full revelation of God's plan, uh, if you do something that uh, is towards righteousness, you're going to reap the fruit of that. If you do something toward wickedness, you're going to reap the fruit of that. And so we have this idea that uh, integrity, following God's standard, is going to be rewarded. Let's look at 19 and verse 1. Proverbs 19 and verse 1. Better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. There's a poor person who walks in his integrity, the one who is crooked, there's that idea again of crookedness, one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. I want us to also look in this same vein at 28 and verse 6. Proverbs 28 and verse 6. Starts off exactly the same. Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. So in both of these, we have it's better to be poor and have integrity than to be rich and crooked in speech, be rich and crooked in your behavior. Basically the same idea. What does this tell us at, at the most basic level? What does this tell us about integrity? Similar to what 
Solomon tells us about wisdom and knowledge. What does this tell us about integrity? Do what? Valuable. It's valuable. Better to be poor and have integrity than to be rich. Well, automatically that means he's setting value of integrity as opposed to worth, worldly wealth, right? It's better to have integrity than to have worldly wealth. That's not something that most people would agree with, right? If you were asked to, on a very minor level that wouldn't hurt anyone, be deceptive, and in the process you get $5 million, I don't know, in the stock market or something, let's say. Let's say that you found some inside information that you're not supposed to use, but you use it. No one's ever going to find out. No one's ever going to be hurt by it. And you get, you know, $5 million. Well, most people wouldn't bat an eye because, yeah, that's technically wrong to lie, but who cares? It's $5 million. But he's saying, no, it's better to have the integrity uh, than to pursue the wealth. Let's look at one more in this section, 20 and verse 7. 20 and verse 7. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Now that's interesting. Up until this point, when we've been talking about the man with integrity, we've been talking about his blessings. But now he says, blessed are his children after him. Why? Okay, good, because they're gaining something valuable that we just talked about right from him. What else? Yes, you're exactly right. What else? Reputation. Oh, good. Reputation. It makes a big difference for a child whether their parents have a reputation of being a person of integrity or they have a re reputation of being a scoundrel. That makes a big difference, right? That affects a lot of things for a child, especially in the early stages of life. What else? Okay, he's an example, uh, so he passes that on in, in several senses, both by his teaching, if he is a person with integrity, right, he's going to train his children, but also by his own example. Uh, you have the idea that's mentioned several times here, and of course it's not a guarantee, but typically speaking, if you are a person of integrity, that will play out not just spiritually, but oftentimes in how you do business, if you're trustworthy, people want to do business with you. If you uh, are in some kind of... Um, some kind of organization or something like that, even if it's not uh, specifically like trade deals or something, but you, you will be rising the ranks within an organization if the people who employ you can trust you. So in all these different ways, uh, that of course can be passed on to children. So in all these different ways, we still have a reward, uh, not only for uh, the person of integrity, but for their children as well. So if I choose to live with integrity, God will notice. And I will receive my reward. It's a choice. Always a choice. All these things are choice. If I choose to live with integrity, God will notice. It doesn't always seem like it, does it? Especially when we have hard decisions. You know, the boss says, you have to do this that's dishonest or you're fired. Or uh, someone says, well, you have to... Uh, Think about Revelation, right? You have to participate in these rituals or you can't be part of the trade guild and do your business. But... If I choose to live with integrity, God will notice, and I will receive my reward. might not be the reward I want at the time. It just depends, but I will receive my reward. Let's go to 11 and verse 13. 11 and verse 13. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. Now, this is another aspect of integrity, right? Kind of the, getting to the idea of gossiping, talking behind people's backs. Why is gossiping or not gossiping, why is that so significant? We have it talked about a lot, right? Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is it about that that makes it worth talking about so much?
have to say about me? You're going to say it to my face. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good. Very good. The end result of breaking trust in that way versus keeping trust is it ends up either hurting people or building a relationship. So you're either pushing people away or drawing people closer. You, know, you think about, and this is true in you know, marriage, it's true in friendship, it's true in parent-child relationships. Every relationship ultimately is built on trust of some kind. And the longer the relationship lasts and the more that trust is proven, the stronger the relationship becomes. Trust takes time to develop deeper and deeper and deeper. And the whole point is, if you aren't keeping trust, you're hurting others. And ultimately, it's going to come back to hurt you, as we're going to see as we move through. Let's look at 25 and verse 13. Proverbs 25 and verse 13. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his master. Now, I want to think just for a minute about the opposite of this. In what way, so we know what we're talking about, in what way could a messenger be unfaithful? He says a faithful messenger. What would an unfaithful messenger look like? Remember, they don't have phones, they don't have internet, anything like that. So they send messages to faraway people through a messenger. How could a messenger be unfaithful? Change the message. Ah, okay, very good. Think about how much power, if you don't have any other means of communication but sending a person with a message, think about how much power that messenger has. There's a reason why, for example, in like the Middle Ages, heralds were a very respected group of individuals because you really had to be uh, a, a proven uh, person of character to make it as a herald. Because if you want to start a war, all you have to do is change a message between one king and another, between one noble and another. So he says, like the cold of snow, he's talking about this is a good thing, something refreshing. Like a cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger. He refreshes the souls of his masters. If you're depending on someone and they prove themselves dependable, that's a positive thing. In contrast with what we just talked about, if you have someone who is trustworthy, that is, that's a wonderful thing. That's an encouraging thing. Look down a few verses, same chapter, verse 19. Here's the other side of that again. Trusting in a treacherous man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. I would guess most everyone in this room has had some form of a toothache. How many of y'all enjoyed that? Whenever I had my wisdom teeth taken out, I had like five wisdom teeth somehow that had grown in, plus another one uh, that had to be taken out that got messed up by the wisdom tooth. And so every corner of my mouth was just, oh, it hurt so bad for like two weeks straight. It was awful. That's what he's describing <laughs> as a treacherous person who is entrusted with something in the time of trouble. You're in trouble, you know, I mean, this, this happens a lot in like TV shows, right? Or something, you, you, you have uh, someone who secretly is like working against the, the main character or something like that. And he's like, oh, we're in trouble. Please go and, and, and get help. Please send for reinforcements, whatever the case might be. And he's just like, okay, I'll go. And, then, <laughs> and he doesn't do it, right? That's the way he's describing here. But that happens more often than we like to think about it. People can be very sly, not usually in life or death type treacherous situations or troubles, troublesome situations, but, but people, can, people can betray us in a lot of other ways. And he's saying, don't be that person. That is causing a great deal of harm. And it might not seem, you know, maybe we're just trying to give ourselves a slight advantage and we don't really think it'll hurt anybody. He's saying, no, this is, this is a very serious thing if we betray trust like this. Look in 28 and verse 18. 28 and verse 18. Whoever walks in integrity will be delivered, but he who is crooked in his ways will suddenly fall. It's interesting. This is echoing a lot of the same things we've just talked about. 
Why suddenly? Why will he fall suddenly? His voice gets caught right away. Okay, good. The nature of breaking trust, going behind someone's back, you think you're getting away with it right until you don't, right? It just kind of happens. All, that, that's, that's how it works usually, you know? You, you think you're getting away with it, and then usually they find out from someone else in those kind of scenarios, right? Or they piece it together or something, and you don't know until later on. Uh, the, the story that comes to my mind is Haman in Esther. He thinks everything is going perfectly, and then just like he's, he's kind of taken aback. There's kind of this bad sign about having to exalt Mordecai, but he still really doesn't think anything major is wrong. And then all of a sudden, just like an absolute ton of bricks on his face at the banquet, Haman is the, is the man that's working against you. And it's like, oh, like how, how do you handle that? It's just, it's so sudden. He went from up on top to down so quickly. That's what he's describing here. Suddenly, it happens suddenly because a lot of times when we're in this kind of, when we put ourselves in this kind of position where we're playing with people's trust, we think we're safe until we're not. And there's no reason to put ourselves in that position in the first place. Look at one more, 30 and verse 10. 30 and verse 10. Do not slander a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be held guilty. All right. Do not slander a servant to his master, lest he curse you, you be held guilty. Someone help us understand the scenario here. What, what is happening that he's describing? So you are saying something bad about a servant, and what happens? Okay. So what's happening here then? You're exactly right. If you say something bad about a servant, typically speaking, what's going to happen? Okay, they'll get called on the carpet, right? They're the ones who'll be in trouble because you're not a servant, right? In this context, they're lower than you. So what's the scenario he's describing? Okay, good. Instead of just rolling over and whatever, having to deal with it, the servant says, no, I'm not going to take this. This, I didn't do anything wrong. And it ends up backfiring on the person who was trying to get in trouble. That's the scenario that he's describing here. So in all of these things, we put this all together. <clears throat> if I have no integrity, those around me will suffer. And eventually, so will I. Usually that first part, we kind of understand, but sometimes we're, we're willing to take the risk, right? Oh, it won't be that bad. They, they won't really be hurt that much by it. Yes, if I have no integrity, those around me will suffer. Well, eventually, so will I. It might not seem like I'm going to suffer. It might not seem like there's going to be any repercussions for me not having integrity, but there will be. Don't know exactly when or where it'll happen. That's why he says suddenly fall, because a lot of times it comes up, uh, sneaks up on us without us expecting it. Eventually, though, we'll suffer for it as well. Let's continue on 25 and verse 16. Now we're moving towards this idea of excess. So we've been looking at the idea of integrity. Now we're moving toward excess. 25 and verse 16. If you have found honey, eat only enough for you lest you have your fill of it and vomit it. Now, this isn't a problem for Liz because she didn't really like honey, but I love honey. Like, I'll put it on toast, I'll put it in yogurt, I'll put it in all sorts of stuff, and it's really good. But have you ever tried to eat just straight honey? Anybody ever tried that? When I was a little kid, I tried that. What happens? It's good for a while, right? But eventually, you start getting kind of like, ah, it just... It's too much. It's, it's like eating a really rich dessert or something. It just starts making it kind of like, Ugh. That's what he's describing here. He's saying, you'll vomit it up if you don't eat just your portion. Well, why? I mean, 
think about this even in expanded sense. Have any of y'all ever eaten too much at Thanksgiving? <laughs> I mean, that's like the common American joke. The day after Thanksgiving, you have to be rolled anywhere in the house, right? Well, why? Well, because it's not that the Thanksgiving dinner was bad. It was too good, right? You ate too much of it, and now all of a sudden it's kind of miserable. Let's look at 25 and verse 27. He continues in on this basic same idea. It is not good to eat much honey, he says in verse 27. Nor is it glorious to seek one's own glory. Now that's interesting. What do those two things have in common? Eating too much honey, seeking your own glory. Seem kind of unrelated, don't they? Okay. Is it bad for people to recognize when you do something good? No. God himself says if you do good, you'll be praised, right? Is it bad to focus on that and try and get more of that and find glory for yourself? Yeah. Is it bad to eat honey? No. Once you get to a certain point, does it become bad? Yeah. The idea is there are things that aren't bad in themselves, but you can have too much of a good thing. That's really the idea of excess itself is taking something that's not inherently wrong necessarily and getting so much of it that either it becomes a focus that shouldn't be a focus or it just becomes something that hurts you instead of being something that helps you. One more in this section, 27 and verse 7. 27 and verse 7. One who is full loathes honey, but to one who is hungry, every bitter thing is sweet. We see this difference in perspective here, right? If you're full, you don't want honey. Why? Well, I mean, I think about whenever we go to restaurants. Nine times out of ten, I don't get desserts at restaurants. You know why? Because I'm full, right? That doesn't sound good at all. I don't want anything else. On the other hand, there have been times where I was really hungry talking like starvation or anything of course but there were times where i was really hungry and something that i usually didn't like i was like oh this is amazing and then i went back you know a couple weeks later i was like oh this is nasty why did i think that was good well it's because i was hungry it's all about perspective if i lose the proper perspective i will turn my blessings into curses this is painfully true in our culture especially because we have so many physical blessings. Compared to most of the world, we are ridiculously rich. And it's so easy for that to turn into a bad thing and not a blessing. If I lose the proper perspective, I will turn my blessings into curses. Let's look at 21 and verse 17. 21 and verse 17, still looking at this idea of excess. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Might be a dumb question, but why? Why will someone who loves pleasure, who loves wine and oil, be poor? I'm just guessing, but I'm thinking wine and oil is not cheap in these days. Okay, the basic answer is this is expensive stuff, right? I mean, the... These are commodities. You think about oil in particular. Oil was a huge deal, especially in like a dry climate like they would have. They would use it like kind of like we use lotion as well as in cooking and things like that. And these were absolute like luxury commodities that they would have. So it's expensive. And if you love it, you're going to be like the guy on Jurassic Park, right? Spared no expense. You're going to go after it anyway. And so you're going to end up poor. Look at 23, chapter over, or a couple chapters over. 23, verses 1 through 3. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Again, I'm going to ask the question, why? Why be so cautious in this scenario? Why is it deceptive food? <clears throat> Maybe setting you up to bribe you. 
doing so. Okay, good. One reason is there might be ulterior motives, right? That's classic scenario. Somebody wants something from you, they're going to give you some nice stuff to kind of butter you up. Why else? I think that's definitely at least a, a one possible explanation that Solomon's trying to get us to think about. What else? Mm. It says something about your character, right? Going back to integrity, it says something about your character when you reveal that you don't really have much self-control. What else? Okay, good. I think about, and again, we are far richer than most of the world. Think about a lot of missionaries who have come from third world countries to America, a lot of times maybe to train to teach the Bible or something like that. But while they're here, they get so used to the lifestyle that we have here, they don't want to go back. Even though they came here to learn about spreading the gospel so they could go back. Now, there are different situations. I'm not saying everyone who stays, stays because of lack of character. I'm saying... That has happened many times. That's a real danger. We can get so used to things that we are exposed to that are positive, that are pleasurable, that it can become uh, something that we become dependent on. One more in this section, 23 uh, verses 19 through 21. Hear, my son, and be wise. Direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. Drunkards and gluttonous eaters of meat. Again, we talked about the idea <laughs> food and drink are expensive, right? So that's part of this. But think about, too, again, he's not describing people who... Now, we're going to get to this topic in a second. People who just enjoy drinking or people who just enjoy eating... He's talking about people who they can be described by their obsession, dependence, focus on that particular pleasure. I think about a story that I was told a while back. I might have told it before uh, about someone who uh, he there would come a, a time at his company where they had this uh, uh, this kind of, you know, free for all little buffet thing that they would have. And he loved this certain kind of salami they would have, but it was too expensive for him to buy it in normal life. So he'd wait all year for this stuff, and he would eat a whole bunch of it, and he would go up behind the building and throw it up and come back and eat more. And it's just like, dude, why? Like, that one little thing is like, I mean, that's like textbook gluttony right there. And I mean, you know, it just... The point is... Where is our focus when it comes to these things? Are we enjoying the blessings of life? Are we letting the blessings of life go to excess and control us? If pleasure becomes my purpose in life, I will experience quite the opposite. It's ironic, right? If pleasure becomes my focus, I'm going to, explore, I'm going to experience the opposite of that pleasure. It's that whole uh, contrast that Jesus talks about, that, that paradox. If you try and save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life, you'll find it. Same principle here. All right. In the last few minutes, let's look at this last section. Let's go 20 and verse 1. If you're thinking about excess, you're probably thinking about a specific type of excess, right? Well, Solomon has some stuff to say about that. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. What is a mocker and a brawler? Do what? Okay. Mocker is translated scoffer a lot of times. The idea of someone who's just causing trouble, speaking against people. And a brawler, we think about a troublemaker in a more physical sense, right? Someone who's just starting fights. You know, people who go into a bar hoping to get into a fight. That kind of idea. But who is a mocker and a brawler? Do what? Yes, but in this verse, he describes wine itself. 
He's personifying wine as being these things. In other words, he's saying, if you partake in this, if you are making this part of your lifestyle, you're flirting with something that is widely recognized as being a negative thing. Look at 23, uh, verses 29 through 35. This is a, a lengthier section, only six or seven verses, but it's a lengthier section here, but it's very uh, a very poignant description of this idea. 23, 29 uh, through 35. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over the wine, those who go to try mixed wine. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies at the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I wake? I must have another drink. Before we dissect this just very briefly, what kind of picture is he painting? Do what? Addiction. addiction. Okay, good. He's painting a picture of addiction. And what kind of picture is it? This is this is ugly. Not just ugly. This is this is pitiful, right? This is this is a very not gruesome in the sense of like violence, but gruesome in the sense of just a life being torn apart. And anyone who has had to deal with a uh, uh, someone who is addicted to alcohol can testify this is a very accurate depiction. I think I've told y'all before my uh, uh, my grandpa struggled with this. I never knew him personally, but I've heard stories about how much trouble that that caused. It's a very very difficult uh, thing, not just for the person, but as we mentioned before, for everyone around you as well. But I want us to think about this question too. What does the old law say about wine? In the sense of intoxicating wine, that's, that's the context here. Wine can mean intoxicating or not intoxicating, that's a whole other discussion. But in terms of like strong drink, alcoholic beverage, what does the Old Testament, the old law say about it? Anybody? It's interesting, as far as I'm aware, now if I have missed something, please someone point it out. I don't know of anything in the law, certainly nothing that outright forbid strong drink, alcoholic beverages. But we see constantly throughout this idea that you gotta be very careful with it. Now I'm not saying, obviously, that's the old law, we're under the new law, so that's not a discussion about us today. That would be a whole other discussion. But my point is, this is not something that was forbidden to them, as far as I can tell from my study of the Old Testament. This is not something that was outright forbidden to the people of Israel, except for Nazarites, by the way. That was uh, something very specifically said. You shall not have either strong drink or any produce of grapes whatsoever. But for everyone else, this isn't something that's outright forbidden. But Solomon is being very, very picturesque, if you will, in describing how dangerous it is to meddle with, how dangerous it is to fall into a pattern of excess and addiction. He's essentially making what uh, we sometimes call the slippery slope argument. Yeah, this is something that technically isn't wrong, but what is he describing? He says, all of these bad things, what do they happen? How do they happen? Look at 23 and verse 30 again. Those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try and mix drink, they just keep, want to keep coming back. It's just got this allure that keeps drawing them in and drawing them in and drawing them in. Now again, a whole other discussion about alcohol for Christians but the point is, in their scenario, in which this was not inherently sinful for them to participate in any way, he's still pointing out even something that for you is not forbidden outright, 
is still something very dangerous that you have to be aware of. Exactly, exactly. I think about um, how, of course, in a completely, talk about a completely different issue, about how Paul says, if you take fire in your bosom, will your clothes not be burned, right? If you go down a path that you know can very easily end in tragedy, well, it seems like it's kind of unwise, doesn't it? And that's how he's describing it. So, in this last section, drawing it again to a bigger principle, why should I allow the pursuit of pleasure to reduce me to misery? Specifically here, of course, she's talking about alcohol as we refer to it. But this could go for anything. This could go for drunkenness. This could go for gluttony. This could go for certain hobbies that can be addictive. This could go for all sorts of things. Why should I allow the pursuit of pleasure to reduce me to misery? And, of course, it's a rhetorical question. I shouldn't. There's no good reason to. And that's the warning that he wants to offer. Any other thoughts before we close for the evening? Thank you.